Hey everyone and welcome back to this class, Deep Reinforcement Learning, Deep Learning in Python Part 7. In this lecture we are going to do a tutorial on the basics of OpenAI Gym. At this point I'm assuming you've already installed it using the instructions from the where to get the code lecture. What we're going to do in this lecture is connect to an environment and play an episode using just random actions. There won't be any learning in this lecture because all we want to do is familiarize ourselves with the API and figure out where all the stuff we need to do learning, like states, actions, and rewards, can be found. If you want to see this code all at once, the relevant file in the course repo is gymtutorial.py. The first thing you'll have to do, of course, is import gym. If this fails, that means you haven't installed the gym properly. The next thing you want to do is get your environment. This is the gym.make function. Notice how in this example we're getting the cart pole environment. As you know, cart pole is the environment where the task is to balance a pole on a cart. Of course, Jim has other environments as well. One way to get a full list of environments is to simply go to their website and click on the link environments. That will take you to this URL. Each environment page has a short blurb that explains what the task is and whether or not the environment has been solved, and a leaderboard, but not much more. Documentation is generally pretty sparse, but more on that later. Now that we have an environment, we want to run an episode, so let's do that. The first thing we need to do before we start the episode is we run the reset function. This puts you into the start state. If you do this in your IPython window, you'll notice that this returns something. It's an array. Well, what's in this array? It looks like an array of four floating point numbers. This, as you might naturally guess, is the start state. Now you might be wondering, well, what is the physical meaning of these numbers? For this, the documentation is a little sparse, but luckily for the first two environments we'll be looking at, this information is available on the wiki which is strangely not linked from the environment page at openai.com. The Carpool wiki can be found at this URL on GitHub, and from there you can find links to other wiki pages as well. What you'll see is that the four numbers represent the cart position, cart velocity, pole angle, and pole velocity. You can also get the min and max values. Now, of course, none of these URLs you have to type out manually. You can copy and paste them from the Python script. You can also get some of this information from the console as well. If you do env.observation space, you'll get back an object that says box4. Let's assign this to a variable called box. If you type in box dot and then you hit tab, you can see a list of attributes and functions you can call. You can call the contains function to check if a vector is part of the observation space. You can look at high and low to see the maximum and minimum values that each element can contain. You can also grab a sample from the state space, which can be useful. While we're doing this, we should look at the action space too, which behaves similarly. If you look at the wiki, you'll see that there are two possible actions, push the card to the left or push the card to the right. This makes the problem a little easier than the full card pull problem, where you have to model the force as a continuous variable. In the console, you can type in env.actionspace and see that this returns a discrete object with the parameter 2. If you type in env.actionspace and hit tab, you can see again some functions and attributes that a discrete object has. Again, we have the contains method and the sample method, and there's an attribute called n that tells us how many actions are in the action space. Actions are always numbered from 0 and up, just like how we treat classes in supervised learning. We are finally ready to start playing an episode. Now that we know what the states and actions are, how do we perform an action that will give us a reward and the next state? The function we're interested in is env.step. It takes in one parameter, the action, and returns four values, the observation, the reward, a done flag, and an info dictionary. We usually ignore the info dictionary since it's for debugging. It can contain useful information to help your agent learn, 
but as per the rules of OpenAI Gym, you are not allowed to use this in your submissions. Because we're not doing any learning in this lecture, we can simply sample random actions until the episode is over. This loop would look like this. This will most likely end pretty quickly because doing random actions won't keep the poll up for long. As an exercise, you may want to add a counter to see how many steps, on average, are completed before the episode is over when you only do random actions. This can act sort of as a benchmark to compare your later algorithms. Hey everyone and welcome back to this class, Deep Reinforcement Learning, Deep Learning in Python Part 7. Since you've just been introduced to the OpenAI Gym interface, we're not going to code anything too complex right away. In this lecture, we are going to add just a little bit of code to the code we just wrote to do a random search in the parameter space for a linear model. In other words, we are going to take our state s, dot it with a vector of weights w, and if this is greater than zero, we'll do one action, and if it's less than zero, we'll do the other action. Let's do a quick overview of the algorithm in pseudocode. What this does is, I'm first going to choose the number of times I want to attempt to adjust the weights. For that number of times, I'm going to generate new weights randomly. Then I'm going to play a number of episodes with these new weights. I need to try more than once, just in case an episode is really long just by chance. From this, I'll calculate the average episode length. If the average episode length for these new weights is better than my best average so far, I'll keep these weights for later. Once I've done this a number of times, I've supposedly chosen some good weights that do well over a number of episodes, so hopefully not just by chance. Then I play a final set of episodes to see how good my best weights perform. If you don't want to try this yourself first, although I highly recommend you do, the relevant file in the course repo is randomsearch.py in the subfolder cardpool. At the top here we have some basic imports, gym and numpy and matplotlib. We also have some future imports just in case you're using Python 3. If you have an old version of future, these imports may not work, so you can upgrade it by doing sudo pip install minus capital U future. The first function here takes in the state s, a vector of weights w, and calculates the dot product. If the dot product is greater than 0, we return 1, otherwise we return 0. Next we have a function to play one episode. It takes in the environment and a set of params. First, we reset the environment to start a new episode and set an initial value for done and t, which will keep track of the length of the episode. Next, we enter a loop. This loop is capped at 10,000 iterations because the random search can actually do pretty well. If that ends up happening, the loop is going to take a very long time or possibly never finish. One weird thing is that it seems that later versions of the gym no longer let you go past 200 iterations, but earlier versions do. To my knowledge, this hasn't been documented. So if you're using a later version of Jim, then you'll automatically get the done signal when you've reached 200 iterations. Inside the loop, we increment t, choose our action, and perform the action. We're ignoring the rewards here, but they are all 1. When we're done, we return t. Notice how I've commented out this env.render function. If you call this, what will happen is a window will pop up and you'll be able to see a video of the episode as it's being played. This makes the script run much slower, of course, so we won't do it. However, you're encouraged to turn it on if you want to see what it looks like. Next, we have a function to play multiple episodes, which calls the previous function multiple times. It takes in the environment, total number of times to play, and the current params. The point of this function is to keep track of all the episode lengths for these parameters and then return the average. Next we have the random search function. We are going to search through 100 random parameter vectors. Each are randomly selected from a uniform distribution between minus 1 and 1. 
In the loop, we call the play multiple episodes function with t equals 100 so that we test each parameter vector 100 times. We get back the average episode length for the current set of parameters and we append this to our list of episode lengths. If this average is better than our best so far, we keep these parameters and we update the best average length. At the end, we return all the average episode lengths and the final params. In the main section, we connect to the cart poll environment, call the random search function, and then plot all the average episode lengths. Once we've done that, we play a final set of 100 episodes with the best parameters. Typically, the average length of these will be close to the best out of the average episode lengths that we plotted in the previous step. Let's run this and see what we get. Hey everyone and welcome back to this class, Deep Reinforcement Learning, Deep Learning in Python, Part 7. In this lecture, we are going to talk about how to save a video of your agent playing an episode. This is really important because it allows you to watch the agent play and see what it has learned through human eyes. When we talk about states, actions, and rewards, things are really abstract. This is actually not a bad thing because it gives us a very powerful framework for building reinforcement learning agents. But it leaves some unanswered questions. Suppose an agent learns to play a video game and can achieve a good high score. You might be curious if the agent has learned to play the video game like a human would, or maybe it does even better. Maybe it uses some unconventional moves that a human would probably not do. These are the things we would like to know. The main changes we'll need to make are as follows. We first need to import the wrappers module from Jim. Then we need to wrap the environment with a monitor object. Notice how we have to give the monitor a directory to save the video in. Other than those two steps, that's it. Notice we're not calling the render function, but the render window will show up anyway and show us a video of the agent playing the episode. Because there aren't too many changes, I'm not going to walk you through the code. Basically, what we've done is added a couple lines to randomsearch.py. The relevant file in the course repo is saveavideo.py in the cartpool subfolder. Let's run this and see what we get. Hey everyone and welcome back to this class, Deep Reinforcement Learning, Deep Learning in Python Part 7. In this lecture we are finally going to start doing some reinforcement learning. Instead of doing something ridiculously complicated this early in the course, we're actually going to take a step back and look at the tabular method again. Why might we want to do that? We want to show that it's not necessary to use the most complicated thing possible. In fact, by making some simple adjustments, you can make what you know already work pretty well. So this lecture is called Cart Pull with Bins, and I said earlier we're going to use the tabular method. This should give you a big hint about what we're about to do. We know that because the state space in Cart Pull consists of continuous variables, the state space is actually of infinite size. However, there are some states that are more likely than others. We know from reading the documentation that if we pass a certain angle or a certain position, the episode is going to end. 
so we know that while some states are technically possible, they are unreachable. We also know that attaining an infinite or very large velocity is highly unlikely, most likely also impossible. So what we can do instead is take a finite amount of four-dimensional space and consider that only. In this image we're showing a 3D box because a 4D box isn't really a nice visualization, but the idea is the same. By cutting up the box into tinier boxes, we now have a discrete and finite state space. Therefore, we can use the tabular method once again. Now this idea of cutting up the state space into boxes sounds simple, but there are some hidden details. For example, how do we choose the box size and the lower and upper limits? What if a state we observe is outside the box? For this first question, we can take sort of a naive approach and just try different numbers until it works. If you wanted to get more complex, you could play a few thousand episodes and plot histograms of each state variable to get a sense of how often you expect to see numbers in each range. For the second question, what do we do if we observe a state outside the box? Well, we can just extend the boxes on the outer edges to infinity. So that takes care of some of the details, but implementing it is going to be quite complex as well. I would encourage you to think about what this code is going to look like. There are going to be a number of steps. First, you need to convert the state into a bin so that you can use it to index a dictionary or an array, which would be even better. This is not easy, so take some time to test out a few ideas. Another small detail I want to mention before we move on to the code is overwriting the default reward. The reward for cart poll is plus one for every time step. When you're doing queue learning with bins like I've described above, this reward structure actually doesn't work too well. What makes it work better is if you give the agent a large negative reward, like say minus 300, every time the episode ends. This incentivizes the agent to avoid reaching this point. Now you might wonder whether modifying the default rewards is a good idea or not. I've seen some debate about it online, but I generally feel that modifying the reward is okay. In the real world, if you're building an agent to solve a novel task, you would be the one defining the rewards anyway. It's up to the programmer to define an intelligent reward structure. Hey everyone, and welcome back to this class, Deep Reinforcement Learning, Deep Learning in Python, Part 7. In this lecture, we are going to use Q-learning to solve carpool with quantized states. That means we're going to bin each state so that the set of states is discrete and finite. We'll be using an array to store the Q-table. If you don't want to code this yourself, although I highly recommend you do, the relevant file in the course repo is qlearningbins.py in the subfolder carpool. At the top, we have some standard imports, and we have future for ensuring this code is compatible with Python 3. Next, we have some functions to help turn the state into a unique number. The build state function takes in a list of integers and treats them like a string of integers and returns the integer representation of that string. The toBin function takes in a value and an array of possible bins and figures out which bin the value belongs in. Next, we have the feature transformer class. This is intended to work like a scikit-learn type of feature transformer, where we have a transform function. Note that it only transforms one observation at a time. One other thing to notice in the constructor is that these high and low limits on the bins may seem somewhat arbitrary. I did a little bit of testing, but it definitely wasn't exhaustive. If you really wanted to know what bins you should use, it would be better to take samples from actual episodes, plot a histogram, and look at the range of values you get. Even better would be different size bins, so that the probability of falling into each bin is equal. Also notice how each of the bin limits is created using linspace. We pass in 9 for the size, because 9 splits gives you 10 bins. Remember that anything higher than the max or lower than the min will go to the bins at the edges. Next we have the transform function, which turns one observation at a time into an integer. It makes use of the build state and two bin functions above.
Next, we have the model class. The constructor takes in the environment and a feature transformer so that they can be used later. Also inside the constructor is our initialization of the Q table. Its shape is num states by num actions, since Q is indexed by state and action. The number of states is 10 to the power of 4, since there are 10 bins for each of the four state variables. The number of actions is just 2. Next, we have the print state into an integer x, and we use that to index Q. Notice that because Q is a 2D array, if we index it with one integer, we actually get back a 1D array. So here we get back the Q for this particular state, but over all actions. This is useful for Q learning because we have to take the max of this. Next we have the update function. This takes in a state, action, and target return. First we convert the state into an integer, and then update Q using gradient descent. Next we have the sample action function. This implements epsilon greedy. So with small probability epsilon, we choose a random action. Otherwise, we choose the best possible action using our current estimate of Q. Next, we have the play1 function. It takes in a model instance, epsilon for epsilon greedy, and gamma, which is the discount rate. First thing we do is reset the environment so we can go to the start state and initialize some variables. Then we enter a loop. Again, this is capped at 10,000, but if you're using a newer version of Jim, you'll automatically get the done signal after 200 time steps. Inside the loop, we choose an action from the model. We set the previous observation variable to the current observation and then perform the action. Next, we add the reward to our total reward. If we got the done signal, that means the pole has fallen down or we've reached the limit in newer versions of Jim. If we haven't hit 200 time steps, we set a large negative reward of minus 300. Next, we update the model using the Q-learning equation using the target return G. When the loop is done, we return the total reward. Next, we have a function for plotting the running average. This is useful because the returns for each episode are going to vary a lot so it'll be hard to see. We're interested in averaging the returns over 100 episodes because the OpenAI documentation says your agent is judged by how well it does over 100 episodes. Finally, we get to the main section. The first thing we do here is initialize the environment, feature transformer, model, and gamma. Next, I give you the option of setting up a monitor. All you need to do to get this to work is pass in the string monitor as a command line argument. Next, we play 10,000 episodes. We set epsilon to be 1 over the square root of n plus 1 so that it doesn't fall too quickly. We play the episode, log the total reward, and print our progress every 100 steps. Once we're done the loop, we print our average reward over the last 100 steps and the total number of steps. Then we plot all the total rewards. This plot is going to have a lot of variability, so it's hard to see how well the agent is doing on average. So the next step is to plot the running average as well. Let's run this and see what we get. Hey everyone, and welcome back to this class, Deep Reinforcement Learning, Deep Learning in Python, Part 7. In this lecture, we are going to discuss RBF networks, because as you'll see, they can be useful in reinforcement learning. RBF stands for Radial Basis Function. They allow us to proceed to the next step of using function approximation. There are two ways to think of an RBF network. The first way to think of an RBF network is that it's really a linear model where we've done feature extraction first, and the features happen to be RBF kernels. We'll be discussing what an RBF kernel is shortly. The second way to think of an RBF network is that it's a one hidden layer neural network 
with radial basis functions as the activation function. Keep in mind that when we first talked about neural networks, we actually looked at them from the reverse perspective. We first looked at the neural network as a big nonlinear function approximator, but then we learned that one way to think of the hidden units is that they were automatically learning feature representations of the input. So what is a radial basis function? It's basically just a non-normalized Gaussian bell curve centered at some center point which we'll call C. C is a vector that lives in the same vector space as the input vectors. Notice how the function depends only on the distance between x and c. So it doesn't matter if x is to the left of c or to the right of c, only the distance matters. That's where the term radial comes from. You can see that the maximum value is 1 when x is equal to c. It then approaches 0 as x goes away from c in any direction. One good question is, how do you choose c? Another good question is, how many c's should you choose? So the number of c's we choose is basically the number of hidden units there will be in the hidden layer. Each hidden unit corresponds to a different RBF with a different center. These centers are sometimes called exemplars. There are a few different ways to choose exemplars. In support vector machines, or SVMs, the number of exemplars is equal to the number of training points, and in fact, they are just the training points themselves. This is one of the reasons why SVMs have fallen out of favor. They don't scale to the data sizes that we have today. Because each training sample becomes an exemplar, training an SVM is order O of n squared, and prediction is O of n, where n is the training sample size. This is an important piece of deep learning history, because SVMs were once thought to be superior to neural networks. Another method is just to sample a few points from the state space. This allows us to limit the number of exemplars we use. Remember that env.observationspace.sample allows us to sample from the state space of the environment. At this point, how many exemplars we choose is just like how many hidden units you should choose in a neural network. It's a hyperparameter that must be tuned. Luckily, although we could, we won't write any code to do the RBF kernel transformation, since these capabilities are already in scikit-learn. Also, our implementation would be unnecessarily slow. The scikit-learn implementation is called RBF Sampler, and it implements a Monte Carlo algorithm that allows us to do the computation much faster. As usual, this has a standard scikit-learn interface. We create an instance, call the fit function, and then from that point onward, we can call transform. So now that we know what an RBF is and how to do the feature transformation, the rest should be easy. We pass the features into a linear regression model and use gradient descent to update the parameters of the linear regression model. Notice how, unlike a feed-forward neural network, the features don't change as we learn. The exemplars we chose at the beginning will remain the same forever. Although this might seem restrictive, it actually works better than a plain feed-forward neural network where we try to run stochastic backpropagation through the whole network. Okay, so that was the perspective where, instead of using polynomials as the feature extractor, like we did in the last course, we use RBF kernels as the feature and then put a linear model on top. The other perspective is that this is actually a one hidden layer neural network. Remember that a one hidden layer neural network is just a nonlinear transformation at the hidden layer and then a linear model for the final layer. Well, this is exactly what we're doing here. An even closer connection can be made if we recognize that a dot product is actually the cosine distance as well. In both cases, we first calculate some kind of distance between the parameter and the input, and then we apply a nonlinear function on top of that. This gives us the value at one hidden unit. It's an interesting connection, but that's as far as it goes. Now let's go through some practical implementation details. You may have noticed that the RBF kernel has a scale parameter, which is like the variance of a Gaussian. Since we don't actually know what scale is good, or perhaps multiple scales are good, scikit-learn has tools that allow us to use multiple RBF kernels with different scales at the same time. This is called a feature union, 
and it essentially allows you to use multiple feature transformers of any kind, not just RBFs, and then concatenate the individual feature vectors together to make one big set of feature vectors. We'll also be standardizing the data before applying the RBF kernel. SKLearn has a class for this too, it's called Standard Scaler. Another opportunity to make use of scikit-learn is the linear regression component with gradient descent. Scikit-learn already has a class for this called SGD regressor, so we are going to make use of that as well. Unlike typical scikit-learn models, instead of calling the fit function, we'll be using the partial fit function, which allows us to do one step of gradient descent only, which is what we want. At the same time, SGD regressor behaves a little strangely compared to what you would expect from a linear model. First, if we don't call the partial fit function at least once, then it won't work because it hasn't initialized any parameters. But at the same time, the first thing we need to do is make a prediction from it because to do Q learning, we need to take the max over all actions. In order to get around this problem, we'll call partial fit with some dummy values, specifically with the start state as input and zero as the target. The second thing that's weird about SGD regressor is that by setting zero as the target, this is going to make all the predictions zero for a while. This is weird because if we were actually using a linear set of weights to make the prediction, then the prediction wouldn't always be zero. However, this quirk is actually useful because for our next task, which is the mountain car environment, at every time step we get a reward of minus one. That means a Q prediction of zero is higher than any return we can get and hence it allows us to use the optimistic initial values method of exploration, which we looked at in the last reinforcement learning course, instead of epsilon greedy. I'll give you the option of trying both in the code. Here's some code to try if you want to prove this to yourself. Feel free to pause the video so you can try it out. The first step is we import SGD regressor and initialize an instance of it. Then we fit an input vector 0, 0 to the target 0. Next we do a prediction on 0, 0. We get 0 as one might expect. Then we can try some other predictions. You'll see that no matter what input we try, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, or even 99, 99, it still predicts 0. This clearly wouldn't be the case if we had a static vector of size 2. The next implementation detail we need to discuss is a technique used by deep Q learning as well. Specifically, instead of trying to model Q of SA with X as the input vector, that is some feature transformation on the state S and action A, we'll instead just make X the transformation of the state S. Since the actions are discrete, we'll instead create a different linear model for each action. So in the case of mountain car where we have three actions, left, right, and do nothing, we'll have three linear models, all giving us the cue for a separate action. Another way to think about this is that it's a neural network with three output nodes. This is exactly the approach we'll be taking when we do deep cue learning. And lastly, I mentioned earlier that we are going to be looking at the mountain car environment next. If you don't know what mountain car is, you can visit the wiki page and the documentation page. It basically works like a swing. You're in a car trying to get to the top of the mountain, but your car can't generate enough force to go straight up the mountain. You therefore need to swing back and forth to gain enough momentum so that you can be propelled to the top. If you look at the wiki, you'll see that mountain car states only have two variables, position and velocity. Unlike car pull, the velocity cannot be unrealistically large. So that makes this problem a little easier. One of the functions we'll be plotting is called the cost to go function, which is a strange name, but it's just the negative of the value function. This is what they call it in Sutton and Bardo. Because the state space is only two variables, this allows us to plot the cost to go function as a three dimensional plot, which we'll be doing in the code. Hey everyone, and welcome back to this class Deep Reinforcement Learning. Deep Learning in Python Part 7. In this lecture, we are going to implement Q-Learning with an RBF network to solve mountain car. If you don't want to code along, although I highly recommend you do, 
the relevant file in the course repo is qlearning.py and the subfolder mountain car. At the top we have a bunch of imports, most of them should be familiar to you. There's a bunch of stuff from scikit-learn that we mentioned in the last lecture. I pasted the defaults for the SGD regressor class here so that you can see what hyperparameters are being used. You can see that we're using squared error with L2 regularization, a learning rate of 10 to the minus 4, and an inverse scaled learning rate, which means it decreases by 1 over t. Next we have the feature transformer class, which does all the feature transformations we mentioned in the last lecture. In the constructor we first gather 10,000 samples from the state space. Next we standardize the observations so that they have mean 0 and variance 1. Next we create a feature union of four RBF samplers with different variances. The number of components that we pass into the constructor means the number of exemplars. Next we fit the RBF samplers to the scale data. Lastly, we make both the scalar and RBF samplers instance variables so that we can use them in the transform function which comes after. Next we have the model class. Similar to our feature transformer, which was more like a collection of transformers, our model class is a collection of other models, particularly one model for each action. In the constructor, we assign useful instance variables and instantiate our SGD regressors. Notice how we're calling partial fit here with a target zero. As we showed in the last lecture, this allows us to use the optimistic initial values method of exploration. The SGD regressor class also requires us to call partial fit before making any predictions, so even if you didn't want to use optimistic initial values, you would still have to do this anyway. Next we have the predict method. It transforms the state into a feature vector and makes a prediction of values, one for each action. This is returned as a numpy array. Notice how we put s into a list before we call transform. This is because by convention, data inputs in scikit-learn must be two-dimensional. A single state is one-dimensional, so this turns it into an n by d matrix where n is one. Next we have the update function, which also transforms the input state into a feature vector. Notice how we only call partial fit for the model that corresponds to the action we took. Also notice how we pass in g as a list. This is because scikit-learn expects targets to be one-dimensional objects, whereas g is just a scalar. Finally we have the sample function, which performs epsilon greedy, which I'm sure you're familiar with by now. Next we have the play1 function. As usual, we start by going to the start state and initializing done, total reward, and a counter. In each iteration of the loop, we choose our action, take the action, update the model, and increment the counter. We return the total reward so we can plot them later. Next we have a function that plots the cost to go. As we discussed in the last lecture, this is a plot of the negative of the optimal value function. It's plottable in this case because the state is two-dimensional, which means we can make a three-dimensional plot. Next we have a function for plotting the running average. This is important because the running average is how you're scored on OpenAI Gym. You also want to make sure your agent's performance is consistent and not just good by chance sometimes. Next we have the main section. We start by initializing the environment, a model, and a feature transformer. We set gamma to 0.99 but you're encouraged to try different values. Again I've added a snippet of code so that you can have a copy of the results saved to disk if you pass in monitor as a command line argument. Next we do a loop through 300 episodes. In the loop we call play1 and we decrease epsilon geometrically. When we're done, we print the results and make the plots we talked about earlier. Let's run this and see what we get.
Hey everyone, and welcome back to this class, Deep Reinforcement Learning, Deep Learning in Python, Part 7. In this lecture, we're going to modify our RBF network code to work for cart pole instead of mountain car. This lecture is all about what those modifications are. The first modification we're going to make is we're going to build our own SGD regressor. This is going to give you some practice with building a gradient descent model, in case you don't remember. In order to make sure it has the same API as scikit-learn's SGD regressor, we need to implement a partial fit function and a predict function. Note that doing this means we won't be using the optimistic initial values method, because the predictions will be determined by the weight. The next modification is important. Recall that in the mountain car code, we sampled from the observation space to get exemplars for our RBF kernels. This is okay for mountain car because the max and min values for each state variable are small. For cart pole, this is not the case. Recall that the velocities can approach infinity. Unfortunately, the OpenAI gym sample function just samples uniformly from the state space, which is not representative of the states you would find yourself in in a real episode. That means these samples would make poor exemplars. Instead, what we need to do is guess what the plausible ranges are. Or if you wanted to get really fancy, you could play a few thousand episodes and sample from those values. Because this state space is different, you also want different scales for your RBF kernels too. I'd encourage you to test them out for yourself before you look at any of my code. Hey everyone, and welcome back to this class, Deep Reinforcement Learning, Deep Learning in Python, Part 7. In this lecture, we are going to implement Q-Learning with an RBF network to solve cart pole. If you don't want to code along, although I highly recommend you do, the relevant file in the course repo is qlearning.py in the subfolder cart pole. At the top, we have all our usual imports. You'll notice the feature union, standard scaler, and RBF sampler from last time. We're also importing the running average function from our previous script. Next, we have our SGD regressor. Very simple class. Each function is basically one line. In the constructor, we initialize some instance variables. In partial fit, we do one step of gradient descent. And in predict, we return the dot product of the input with the weights. Next, we have the feature transformer, which is subtly different from the one we use for mountain car. Instead of sampling from the environment, we're sampling from a uniform distribution around the points we think will be good representatives of what we'll see during training. We also want to keep track of the number of dimensions so that we can initialize SGD regressor later. Next, we have the model class. This is pretty much the same as before as well, except the constructor for SGD regressor is different because we wrote it. It now takes in the dimensionality of the weights. Remember, we have one SGD regressor for each action. In predict and update, this is an alternative way of converting a 1D array into a 2D array. This is because in our SGD regressor class, we want NumPy arrays and not lists. Next, we have the play1 function. This is also pretty much the same as before, except we're going to stop at 2,000 iterations. Our model can potentially get really good at keeping the pole balanced, so we don't want this taking forever. Notice how we still have this reward hack to give the agent a large negative reward if the pole falls down, and that we are still doing Q-learning. Next, we have the main function. This is all stuff you've seen before. We play a bunch of episodes, update Epsilon as we go, keep track of the total rewards. We then plot the total rewards and the running average so we can see how consistent the agent is. Let's run this and see what we get.
Hey everyone, and welcome back to this class, Deep Reinforcement Learning, Deep Learning in Python, Part 7. In this lecture, we are going to do a Theano warm-up. As you know, deep neural networks are easiest to write with frameworks like Theano and TensorFlow, so that you don't have to derive any of the gradients yourself. We've been slowly building up to this point. First, we looked at Q-learning without any function approximation. Then we looked at Q-learning with linear function approximation and gradient descent using scikit-learn, and then we looked at the same method but without using scikit-learn instead of writing the model from scratch in NumPy, and now we are going to re-implement the same thing in Theano. This is designed to remind you of all the important parts of a Theano neural network, creating graph inputs, defining shared variables, which are parameters that can be updated, creating the cost function, defining the updates, and compiling functions to do training and prediction. If you don't want to try to code this yourself, although I highly recommend you do, since it's only a few lines, the relevant file in the course repo is theanowarmup.py in the subfolder cardpole. So the first thing you'll notice is that this file is pretty small. All we need to do is build an SGD regressor to overwrite the one from the other Q-learning script. At the top we're importing NumPy and Theano, and also Q-learning which is the script we just looked at. Next we have the SGD regressor class. Now most of the work is in the constructor. At the top we're printing out hello Theano so that you can confirm that this is the SGD regressor that's being used when you run the script. Next we initialize W as usual and place it in a Theano shared. Then we create our inputs and targets X and Y. As usual X is two dimensional, Y is one dimensional. Next, we calculate our prediction y hat, which is the multiplication of x and w. Then we calculate the squared error, which is the cost. We get the gradient, and we define the gradient descent update. Then we compile two functions, one for training and one for prediction. In partial fit, we simply call the train op, and in predict, we call the predict op. In the main section, all we do is replace QLearning's SGD regressor with the one we just made, and then we call its main function. Let's run this and see what we get. Hey everyone, and welcome back to this class, Deep Reinforcement Learning, Deep Learning in Python, Part 7. In this lecture, we are going to do a warm-up in TensorFlow, again just replacing the SGD regressor class. Again, I would strongly recommend trying to do this on your own first, now that you know what the format is going to be. The relevant file in the course repo is tfwarmup.py in the subfolder cardpoll. So at the top, the imports are the same, except now we're importing TensorFlow instead of Theano. In the constructor for the SGD regressor class, we start out by printing hello TensorFlow so that you know this code is running. Next, we create our updatable params, which in TensorFlow are called variables, and we specify the shape and type of the training data, which in TensorFlow are called placeholders. Notice how W is a 2D matrix where the size of the second dimension is 1. This is because the matmul function will complain if W is one dimensional. So later when we do prediction, we'll have to flatten this using reshape so that the prediction is one dimensional and can be subtracted from the targets. Once we've done that, we can define the cost function, which is the squared error. Next, we initialize the parameters and start a session. Notice how I'm using interactive session here. This allows me to use the same session from within different functions. Partial fit and predict are as expected. We just call the train and predict ops we created earlier. In the main section, all we do is replace QLearning's SGD regressor with the one we just made, and then we call its main function. 
Let's run this and see what we get. Hey everyone and welcome back to this class, Deep Reinforcement Learning, Deep Learning in Python, Part 7. In this lecture, we are going to discuss what might happen if you try to plug in a neural network into the code we just wrote. I am also going to suggest some exercises for you to try. Because there are so many options, some of this stuff even I haven't had a chance to try myself. But the hope is that, because we're such a big class, everyone can try something and we can pool our results together. First, you've already seen that we can plug in TensorFlow or Theano into our Q-Learning script. You also know how to build a neural network in TensorFlow and Theano because we've done this many times in previous deep learning courses. So one interesting thing to try would be to replace our linear model with a nonlinear deep neural network. You might also want to remove the RBF layer since we expect that a neural network should be able to come up with its own features. One downside to this is the catastrophic forgetting effect. This idea has gotten lots of attention recently because researchers have found ways to successfully implement transfer learning. In other words, they could train an AI in one game and use parts of the neural network to improve training on another game. They then showed that the neural network was still able to play the old game, so the neural network didn't simply just learn the new game and forget the old game. The reason this research is noteworthy is because this is not how neural networks work by default. In a more typical case, we actually expect the neural network to forget how to play the first game. But this forgetting effect doesn't only apply across different tasks. As you've seen, when we do stochastic and batch gradient descent, the cost function can jump around quite a bit. I would say the effect seems to be more pronounced on highly nonlinear regression problems, which is exactly what we're working with now. Ideally, you'd like the data in your cost function to represent the true distribution of the data. When you train on all training data simultaneously, this is actually only an approximation of the true distribution. It's like doing a clinical trial for a drug. You might have a sample from thousands of people, and you hope that they are representative of the population as a whole. So when you use batch or stochastic gradient descent, this approximation becomes even worse. What makes it even worse in this course than a typical stochastic gradient descent is that there is a large bias in the ordering of the training samples. In particular, you're always proceeding from the start state to the end state. There is no randomization, which is recommended if you're doing stochastic or batch gradient descent. So what happens is, you'll train the neural network to do well in a cost that's with respect to the most recent samples, but then you've forgotten about the earlier samples. One thing you might want to try that I haven't tried is dropout. Dropout regularization may be able to help since it means some of the weights that connect some of the nodes will randomly not be affected during any particular training iteration. You can also try other types of regularization and different architectures as well. Hey everyone, and welcome back to this class, Deep Reinforcement Learning, Deep Learning in Python, Part 7. In this lecture, we are going to summarize everything we learned in this section. This section was all about introducing you to the OpenAI gym and then getting you to build gradually more and more complex reinforcement learning agents using what you already know. First, we started by looking at the OpenAI gym interface. We saw how we could grab any environment, look at its state space, look at its action space, and play any episode we saw how we could save a video of our agent playing an episode. The first algorithm we looked at was random search for carpool. 
Random search is easy to conceptualize because it doesn't require any complicated math. Instead, we just keep choosing random weight vectors until we find a setting that's good. Next, we looked at Cartpole again, but using Q-learning with binned states. Using binned states allowed us to use the tabular method, which you're familiar with from the last course. This example also helps reacquaint you with Q-learning, which is a simple TD0 method we reviewed earlier. After that, I introduced you to RBF networks. RBF networks are historically interesting because they are related to both support vector machines and neural networks. In particular, they allowed us to use a neural network with nonlinear features, but to still keep using a linear gradient descent algorithm. We saw that the other perspective of this model is that the RBFs are doing a feature expansion, and all we're doing is applying linear regression on top of that. We then looked at the mountain car task with Q-learning and RBF networks. This is the first time we used an approximation method in this course. Doing this example allowed us to learn about some important implementation details, like choosing RBF exemplars, combining features, and other scikit-learn tools. We then applied Q-learning with RBF networks to the Carpole task. We saw that we had to make some modifications because Carpole's state space extends to infinity, and OpenAI Gym samples uniformly from this state space without regard to the probability that you'd end up in any particular state. We know that these won't give us good exemplars for our RBFs. In this example, we took the next step and built our own linear function approximator with gradient descent in NumPy. Next, we did a warm-up in Theano, where we took the previous code and rewrote the linear function approximator in Theano. This allowed us to reacquaint ourselves with important Theano features, like creating shared variables, data variables, update equations, and Theano functions. Next, we did the same warm-up in TensorFlow, where we rewrote the function approximator again. This allowed us to reacquaint ourselves with important TensorFlow features, like creating variables, placeholders, sessions, and optimizers.